The Free Enterprise Society was formed over 30 years ago by a group of individuals who were very concerned about the simultaneous expansion of bureaucracy, erosion of individual rights, and plunder of private wealth by slick government debt and taxing schemes. Their mission is to promote free enterprise worldwide and restore lost liberties and freedoms in America under the organic National Constitution of the Republic of the United States of America. To further their goals, the Free Enterprise Society arranges training and seminars to educate the people across the country. Sam Paredes, Director of Gun Owners of California. Sam Paredes has been working with Gun Owners of California for over 30 years and has been Executive Director for the past 10 years. GOC is a nonprofit lobbying organization formed to protect and preserve our Second Amendment rights in California. Sam is also director of the GOC Campaign Committee, which is dedicated to defeating anti-gun politicians and replacing them with solid pro-gun leaders. Paredes has been interviewed by Fox News, ABC World News Tonight, and a significant number of radio stations and newspapers throughout California as an expert on gun laws in the Golden State. He has testified in hundreds of legislative committee hearings and has lobbied the California Fish and Game Commission and the Department of Fish and Game, as well as the California Department of Justice. He is a regular contributor and columnist for California's only conservative magazine devoted to covering state government, California Political Review. He is an expert and has given workshops in confrontational politics to gun clubs, Tea Party groups, and conservative organizations in Missouri, Nevada, and throughout California. Born in Los Angeles to immigrant parents in 1956, Sam is the second of three children. He attended Pepperdine University on scholarship and graduated in 1978 with a degree in political science and studied at the Foundation for Economic Education in New York. A member of the Board of Directors of Gun Owners of America and Treasurer of Gun Owner Foundation, Sam is an avid outdoorsman and enjoys precision, tactical, and cowboy action shooting, hunting, fishing, golfing, and travel with his family. He serves as a worship leader in his church and directs an a cappella singing group in the Gold Country foothills. His topic this evening is Gains Made in Preserving Gun Rights in California and the USA. All right, we've got another speaker who's been really working hard preserving our liberty in the area of the Second Amendment. Anyone know what that is? Bang, bang. Bang, bang, bang. bang. <laughs> you know, part of this thing is attitude. It's, uh, you know, you get, a, you get a nice new pair of cowboy boots and you slide it on and what have I mean, you. you, you your personality changes. <laughs> really, you feel you're a little tougher. You feel really good. And you walk funny. You got that John Wayne swag. <laughs> I don't want to tell, but that's because guys don't like high heels. Really, it's just so we don't fall down. But whatever. But you get you get a good attitude. And this next gentleman has has attitude, and he goes after the state pretty hard. And I think you're going to really enjoy it. He's the uh, uh, been with the gun owners of California for 30 years and now is the current executive director for the last 10 years, uh, Sam Paradis, ladies and gentlemen. I don't usually use one of these, but since it's being uh, recorded and streamed to other folks, I'll, I'll go ahead and speak into the mic. I just came back from giving a four-hour workshop to a bunch of um, Tea Party folks. Uh, the workshop was on confrontational politics. It was about how to fight the left and be successful. It was about knowing about ourselves and knowing about the other side and how they work so that we can defeat them in the arena of politics. I'm Sam Paredes. I grew up in East Los Angeles, and Pilgrim, I do wear cowboy boots. Um, I've been up here for a long time, 30 years, since 1980. Came up here to work with Senator Richardson, my boss, our founder and chairman, 
uh, been involved with gun owners and lobbying in uh, recruiting candidates for local and state office and uh, have been fighting to defend the right to keep and bear arms that entire time. Um, if you don't know about gun owners, California Gun Owners of America, we're actually the oldest pro-gun political action committee in the country. Senator Rachel Richardson, our founder and chairman, was a member of the board of directors of the National Rifle Association. And as a member of the board, he went to them and said, hey, some of you folks might remember Harlan Carter, and Neil Knox, and that gang, the old guard. And he said, hey, you guys, they're trying to ban handguns in California. Do you care if we start one of those new political action committees? And they actually took a vote. And they said, sure, they'll go right ahead. And they said, and by the way, if you want to do that, why don't you just use our mail guy, the one who does all of our membership stuff, if you need somebody to do the mail for you. So he came back to California in 1974-75, and, and I have to, to, to uh, um, break for a, a real quick comment here. I want to thank Sheriff Mack, not only as one of my heroes in the Second Amendment, a guy who has put it on the line so many times, in so many ways, so courageously, that it has given us, many of us, the, the willingness and the spark to fight. He's encouraged us. He worked with us with Gun Owners of America for, for many years, and he is a true patriot. And, and, and I've, I've been with GOA and GOC for 30 years, and this is the first time I've actually gotten to meet him. And I got goosebumps. I don't know about you. <laughs> so thank you, Sheriff Mack. Thank you, sir. So H.L. came back to California, and in the first year of operation, he sent out some mail. And he said, hey, if you support the Second Amendment, if you do not want your gun rights taken away in California, send us a contribution. In the first year, we got over 300,000 individual contributions. Had never been done before. As a matter of fact, in the first eight years of operation, GOP in California stood for Gun Owners Party. <laughs> and that's because we actually gave more money to conservative, conservative Republican candidates than the entire Republican Party did. We gave more money. And we elected some hardcore conservatives. And from 1975, when Senator Richardson first started Gun Owners, and we defeated um, the, the handgun ban that was sponsored by uh, Senator Alan Cerrotti of uh, West Los Angeles. And I don't know what it is about West Los Angeles, but they keep sending anti-gunners. And then um, from that time until 1989, not a single anti-gun law was passed. People are touting right now, hey, Jerry Brown is pro-gun. He never signed an anti-gun law as governor of California. Senator Richardson reminded me, hey, he not only, he not only didn't sign any laws, none of them ever came to his desk. Because at that time, for those eight years, gun owners of California, who we were the, the, the big lobbyist player in town, we made sure that none of the bills ever made it to his desk. <laughs> of course, he talks about the guns that his father had given him, some shotguns and how he, he's proud of them. People talk about his amicus brief to the Supreme Court inviting it to accept the uh, McDonald case and to incorporate the Heller decision to all of the states, and we'll talk about that in just a minute. Only one problem. If you read that amicus brief, he goes on to say, well, you know what? Uh, we want you to incorporate the Second Amendment and, and, and into the states and local governments, but, you know, like California, who has been forward-thinking and has things like assault weapons bans and, and safe handgun laws and 10-day waiting periods and stringent CCW laws, that's okay. Uh, he, he, he let the court know that he thought those issues were fine under a Second Amendment. I have a problem with that. I hope you do too. So, we've done a couple of things. Gun Owners California has done really only two things in, 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 in California. We've lobbied on your behalf. We've been your voice before the state legislature. We've learned how the process works 
and we've been able to adapt, improvise, and overcome, as the Marine Corps says, for 35 years. You say, how'd you do that? Well, an example of the results of our, our, our efforts are that every anti-gun bill that was before the state legislature this year was defeated. Yeah. They wanted to register rifles and shotguns, we defeated them. They wanted to ban open carry, uh, carrying of unloaded handguns, and we defeated them, and I'll tell you the story about that. They wanted to expand the lead ammunition ban to, to include other areas because ultimately they don't want us to use any lead because it's a foreign substance. It doesn't matter that it comes out of the earth. It doesn't matter that it's been used since this country was formulated. It's, it's been the ammunition of choice in every gun that's ever existed. <laughs> doesn't matter. It's foreign substance. It's poisonous. We need to stop it. Really what they're trying to do is to say, we want to do everything we can to make it more difficult for people to exercise their Second Amendment rights by getting rid of lead and making it so expensive for them to get anything else. Maybe more people won't buy guns. That's the way they think. And, um, you know, we had the, the, all of these goofy bills that we were able to defeat. And it's only because we have been in the legislature for 30 years. Let me tell you. We know that it is very difficult to change the mind of anybody who is there. They go there already with their mindset. They're either anti-gun or they're pro-Second Amendment. In the 30 years that I've been doing that, maybe, maybe 10 times, we've been able to change an anti-gunner's mind and get them to vote for reason and to defend the, the Second Amendment. That's why we believe that we should elect people who already believe like we do. If they don't, what are we doing? Why not? We know we're not going to change their minds, so let's recruit the people who believe like we do and elect them. We'll train them. We'll help to fund them. We'll, 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 we'll invite our, our members and volunteers to work for them, and then we'll get them into the legislature. Then we'll help them to find the right staff, the staff people that'll say, hey, 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 hey. You need to, you don't, don't slip in with these other guys. Don't listen to these lobbyists. Don't listen to the leadership that's trying to lead you astray and get you to go along to get along. That's the importance of, of getting good, law, good staff people and we can help them to find those kinds of people. Of course, best of all worlds would be for us to go back to a part-time legislature. That would be an okay thing. And let me tell you why, it would just be okay. When we had a part-time legislature, when Senator Richardson first came into to, to Sacramento, they actually sponsored as many bills then as they do now. The big difference is that back then, the average part of the budget that they had was maybe fifteen dollars or $20,000. If you took the budget and you divided it by the number of bills, it was about $15,000, and that was a couple million dollars. And now, it's in the tens of millions per bill. And that's how come they can come up with a $20 billion deficit. And that's how come they can get together and, and solve a budget that next year is going to start off with a $10 billion deficit. You know, these people are nuts. They're nuts. So, an amazing thing has been happening throughout America. There has been a rise of the people, a rising. People have gotten tired. They've turned off American Chopper and, and Deadliest Catch and my favorite diners, drive-ins, and dives <laughs> and man versus food. They've turned off the TV and they've said, I gotta do something about it. I gotta get involved, I gotta do something. Gotta, gotta participate in this. I gotta fight for my freedom. Hence the rise of the Tea Party movement. Now you folks that are here, you are Old school, full time, long time Tea Party people. Isn't it nice that other people are finally clicking in and saying, hey, we need to do that. We have a lot that we can offer to them. We have a lot that we can teach them. We have to open them, bring them in with open arms. We have to be careful because we have so much experience at doing this bottom up grassroots thing that we can go and we can scare the heck out of them. We can go and tell them story after story after story and they start going, oh my goodness, oh my goodness, oh my goodness, I don't know if I want it, it's too much work. Instead, 
If we find out why they want to get in, is it the IRS? Is it overtaxation? Is it the issue of, of whatever, abortion, gun control? Whatever the issue is, we need to invite them in. Hey, come on in, get together. There are a lot of like-minded people that are talking about that. And then once they come in and they sit down and they talk with us and they meet us, they realize, hey, these are real people just like me. And we start to rub off on them. <laughs> Senator Richardson says you can, you, know, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. But if you hang around long enough, sooner or later, they will take a sip. We need to be patient. They are coming. They are rising. We need to be organizing them. We need to be helping them to have an impact in elections. We need to, we need to help give them the information that we're talking about here in this, in this uh, um, convention here so that they can be armed with the truth, so that their eyes can be open. And once we get them in, they're willing to listen. We've made the, made the mistake sometimes of going out and trying to smash educate people. You know, boom, throw it in their face instead of being patient and listening to them and trying to understand what it is that is their hot button issue. Because I pretty much guarantee that everyone out there has a hot button issue. And virtually all of the hot button issues will break our way towards freedom. If we push that button, we get those people excited and we bring them in. Whether it's, you know, Something like the Second Amendment can take a mild-mannered baker or barber or mechanic or aerospace worker and turn them into a flaming-haired, red, white, and blue dripping patriot who will do anything they can to preserve their rights. And the same is true on a bunch of other issues. And we need to find those issues. And we need to get these people involved. And we're doing it. We're doing that. It's happening. This is our opportunity. You know, the left takes a look at what's going on. First of all, let me, let me, a quick update on the Second Amendment. The UN, small arms uh, uh, treaty, um, it's anti-gun, they want to take all our guns away and all that stuff. <coughs> Praise the good Lord that the UN is the only thing that goes even slower than Congress. <laughs> Okay, the, the, the session, the conference on the, the, the small arms treaty has adjourned for the year. They haven't taken out any of the gun control stuff. They will come back next year and they expect to have a report out by the year 2012. And if we do our job, that gives us two elections to elect flame-throwing, patriotic members of the United States Senate who would never, ever ratify any treaty that were to come out of the United Nations. And if you didn't have that kind of hope, if you didn't have the, the, that, that, that vision to see that we can do that, you probably wouldn't be here. But you have hope. Not the hope that the dope in the White House has, it's kind of hope that is based in reality because you are putting shoe leather to that hope by being here and being active, by, by supporting candidates, by supporting issues and organizations that are fighting for freedom, by going to the courts and fighting for freedom in lawsuits, by supporting lawyers that are taking the fight to the other side, those that are crushing the left. Because frankly, you know, Freedom reigned supreme in the United States for a long, long time. And it's been under our watch that things have started to deteriorate. And you know what? I'm going to say it right now. Shame on all of us. But that's done. All is forgiven. Because it's, we are rising. And we are fighting back. And we know that the fight that we're in is not temporal. It's not temporal. It's eternal. Because we love our children and their children enough to fight for their freedom. We know that the federal government right now is putting debt on our grandkids and great-grandkids' heads, and that's wrong. And right now we are fighting back. We are finding candidates throughout the state of California that are willing to fight back. You know what? The left and the media, mainstream media, have no idea what you're about. They don't understand you in the least, and they don't give you credit for anything that you've done and accomplished. They look at Massachusetts, New Jersey, Virginia, 
Florida, Kentucky, Colorado, Utah, Alaska, Nevada. What's going to happen over here in Nevada with Harry Reid next year, and what's going to happen here in California with Babs Boxer, and they have no idea how it's happening. They have no connection with the grassroots. They have no understanding or capability to understand that America is rising and fighting back in a very real way. And you know what? Ronald Reagan once said, you can do amazing things if you don't care who gets the credit. Fine, frankly, I don't care if I, if I get any credit as long as I'm living in a free country. And I think all of you would agree with that. Amen. No? So we've got a ways to go. We've got a ways to go. We've got some, some mountains we have to climb. We've got some fights we have to fight. We have to stay involved. We have to take every opportunity we can to organize and, and to fight. And you know what? This November 2nd, when we see a lot of great candidates that, that go to the, to the Congress and to the legislature and, and to the government in California and stuff like that, we have a job to do. You know, for these candidates who, who go there, it's, they walk through the halls, through the, the, the portals of the capitals in Sacramento and Washington, and it's like the good Lord has blessed them with infinite wisdom and knowledge. <laughs> All of a sudden, their feet don't quite touch the ground. They're floating. You and I would walk through those, through those portals and we'd feel the oppression of tyranny and evil. But these people who are now elected, they walk in. They never tell a joke that isn't funny anymore. <laughs> you know? They, 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 they are addressed as senator, congressman, Mr. President, assemblyman, certainly not by ma'am or sir, because, you know, they've earned those titles so, so well, you know, and they, they're, they're addressed with these titles. Your Highness could be duplicated for some of the, 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 the way they are addressed by people. Lobbyists, there's a peer group shift. We are the peer group that elect them and send them, and then when we get over there, if we don't do anything, their new peer group are the lobbyists and the special interest groups the leadership of the, of, of the, the Congress and, and all of that gobbledygook and just evil in general. And you know, we don't send supermen and superwomen to Congress. They need our support. We need to send them with a, a wire clipped to the back of their shirt of their coat and as they go and we just reel it out, reel it out, staying connected with them and say, hey, remember who sent you here? We're here, we're praying for you, we're supporting you. This is how we want you to vote on cap and trade. We're with you, remember. Remember you came to my kid's birthday party last year, you were there, remember? We are your family, we are your peer group, we are the ones who bring you to the dance. Remember that. And every once in a while they will stray because virtually all politicians do. We have to be strong enough and bold enough to whack them. Jerk on that, on that wire. Bring them back in line. And then, if they continue to stray, we need to reel them back in and bring them back home. All the way home. And send a fresh person out there to take on the fight. You know, it's a military uh, 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 concept. You send out troops to fight, and then sometimes after they've done the, the job, they've fought the fight, they are, they've been beaten and worn, and even when they've been victorious, they bring them back home for rest and reorganization, or relaxation, or recuperation. And that's what we have to do with a lot of our politicians. We need to be willing to do that. Running for office, I encourage all of you who have that fervor, no matter what party it is you're in. We should be working to take over all of the parties. The Democrat Party now in, in, in America is not Herbert Hoover's party. The Republican Party is not um, Teddy Roosevelt's or even Ronald Reagan's party. It's not. You know, being a member of a party, what it does is it gives you the, the legal right to vote in a primary because they have so strayed away from any sort of philosophy. We are the salt, we are the flavor, we are the ones who have to be infusing strength in all of the parties. 
so that we are arguing about the nitpicky issues of freedom. Okay, this year we're going to get rid of HUD, we're going to get rid of the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms, and the Environmental Protection Agency. And we're arguing with the, with the other party because they also want us to go after the Department of Education and the Department of Commerce, which doesn't create any commerce. <laughs> and then, then we can argue about the, 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 the Treasury and the Federal Reserve. That's the kind of dialogue we should have amongst the parties. The timing in which we decide to take these entities apart and restore freedom. Bringing the government back to its constitutional limits. Getting rid of all of the regulations and allowing the free market to reign unfettered. Wouldn't that be great if we were great. if we had to sit down and, and, and decide between Democrat, Republican, Independent, Constitution, AIP, whatever the parties are, and, and, and the, you know that the fight between them, you're picking as to which, which agencies of government are they gonna get rid of first? I wanna go for the most aggressive. Oh, I think we need to go a little bit slower. But that would be the difference in, 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 the, in the people. We can achieve that if everybody through their own sphere of influence becomes flavor for each of these parties. Now mind you, the Democrat party will be the hardest to go after because the left wing, the hardcore leftists who believe in the Leninist doctrine are fully entrenched there. But they can be overturned. They can be fought and they can be defeated. That's our task. You know what? People say, it's too big a goal to reach. It's too big. It's too much. Let me tell you what Senator Richardson did as a minority. He served for 22 years in the state's Senate. He's arguably the godfather of the modern conservative movement in California. He was a, a, a uh, uh, I believe it was like a regional director of the John Birch Society before he came in, in into government. He was a member of the, the legislative un-Americans activity. He was anti-communist, conservative, unbending, patriot, loved freedom, understood what freedom was all about. So he was never a member of the majority, and this is what happened. He defeated Rose Byrd, Cruz Reynoso, and, 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 and uh, um, Justice Grodin with a committee that he started. These were the Supreme Court justices that were the roadblock for the death penalty in California. Case after case after case had never been done before. He did this as a member of the major uh, minority. He overturned Jerry Brown's veto of the death penalty. The death penalty, he forced it to be passed by putting it, by sending mail to, to assembly districts and senate districts throughout the state of California. There was an uprising of the people, much like today. They told their legislators, Democrat or Republican, we want the death penalty back in California. So they voted it, they passed it by a majority. Went to Jerry Brown's desk, he vetoed it. He's anti-death penalty. Came back to the legislature, Senator Richardson said, okay, we're gonna vote to override. Oh my goodness gracious. You should have seen the number of wet pants <laughs> that were worn by uh, folks in the legislature, both Republican and Democrat. But they caused so much pressure as a member of a vocal and organized minority, letting the public know what their representatives were doing, and he forced them to pass, pass by one vote. I remember this picture of Assemblyman Henry Mello. He then went on to be a senator. It was in all the newspapers. His hand was in his head. He was sweating profusely and he was crying, knowing that he was gonna be the last vote to, to reinstitute the death penalty in California. Mm -hmm. And there was a lot of pressure from the left to, to prevent him from doing that. But it happened. What else did he do? He passed the Castle Doctrine, the first Castle Doctrine that was passed in the country. That means, you know, somebody comes into your home, you shoot them and you kill them, it's their fault, not yours. He passed that law. He passed, as a member of the minority, he passed the preemption law that said that cities and county governments, the whole purview of registration and regulation of firearms was usurped by the state instead of local governments. Because 
it would make you a criminal if you went from one city to the next and they all had different gun control laws. He passed that law as a member of the minority. He passed the toughest anti-child crime bills at the time that had ever been passed. Tough, anti-drug crimes, bills like that. He passed a grand total, I believe, of 11 major bills as a member of the minority. Wouldn't it be great if we sent legislators and all they did was pass 11 bills in 22 years of service? The rest of the time he was there fighting to kill everything he could, to defeat things, to dismember government, to take it apart, to vote no, not to allow it to grow any bigger. The only things that he supported were those things that really had an impact on us. He did that as a member of the minority. Imagine what we could do if we take a majority, not with Republicans, but with conservatives of the United States Senate or the Congress or both, or the State Assembly or the State Senate. Imagine what we can do. When we are in charge, it is our will, our way of thinking that rules the day. We are not going to be like the leadership of the Congress right now, the Republican leadership that's saying, well, you know, we don't think that we want to overturn um, the, the Obamacare. We, we want to work it out and make it work. The conservatives, the Tea Party folks that are going back there and saying, nah, we're going to overturn it. We're going to send it to the president's desk. And if he vetoes it, it's going to come back and we're going to put everybody on the line by making them vote to override that veto. And you know how many wet pants there are going to be in Congress when that happens? It's going to be a lot. And those are the people that we need to support. The Jim DeMintz, the one United States Senator who told the Senate Repu Republican Congress, uh, National Committee, hey you guys, love you, but you can take a flying leap for all I care. I'm going to start my own political action committee. I'm going to support nothing, nothing but flame-throwing, rock-hard, constitutionally-based conservatives. Vast majority of them Christians in the primaries. The Republicans are saying, oh, we don't even want to get involved in the primaries. Well, they had to, and they did, because they wanted to support their establishment-type candidates. And you know what happened? Jim DeMint and his little ragtag team of rebels and all of the people that contributed to his political action committee won in virtually every race. Yeah. Do you think he's a, 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 a popular guy amongst the Senate caucus right now in Congress, in, in the U.S. Senate? They hate his guts. As a matter of fact, they're trying to, to set up a process to make it difficult to have, for him to have influence on the incoming freshmen. They're trying to get one of our other heroes, Tom Coburn of, of Oklahoma, to cave in and to work for the leadership as opposed to teaming up with Jim DeMint because they know if you team up Jim DeMint and, and Tom Coburn of, uh, of Oklahoma, you're going to have a very powerful team. Just two guys, and they fear them like nobody's business. That's why they're doing everything they can to try to put a wedge between those two guys. As a member of the minority, a vocal and organized minority, we can do amazing things. Think of it this way. How many of you think that Daryl Steinberg and Juan, um, he likes to pronounce Perez, Perez, really accurately represent the, the mainstream political philosophy of of, of Californians, your average Californian? Probably not. Do you think that they actually represent the political philosophy of even just the Democrats? Probably not. They are left-wing, hardcore activists, movers and shakers. They are the ones who figure out the plans and implement the plans. You know what? They rule the caucus with fear. There are a lot of members in there who vote their way because they know that if they don't, they're gonna have a primary challenge against them. And the one most important thing to most candidates is re-election. Well, it needs to be our vocal minority that needs to rule in, in the caucuses, in, in, in the legislature. We need to fight back. And you know what? I wanna encourage you to do this. 
If you hear about a, a, a lobby day in, in Sacramento put on by um, Capital Resource Institute or Gun Owners of California or any of the other groups that have a capital lobbying day so that you actually get to go and talk to legislators, do it. Be there. Go in there. Let me tell you what happens. You go in there, uh, the Capital Resource Institute, they had a bunch of Tea Party people show up for a lobby day. They came in, they, they, they learned how to do it, the proper way to knock on the door and who to talk to and how you're being brushed off and who's giving you a real good break and, and, and how to talk to these people. I went to the restrooms. That's where you get all the intelligence at the Capitol. You go into the bathroom and I go into the stall and I close the door and I sit there and wait. Sure enough, the staff, staff guys come in and say, hey, what? Are the Tea Party people in your office? Yeah, they came in. What were they like? Oh, at first we were kind of scared, but you know, it kind of made sense on some stuff. Oh, well, they did with us too, but we're not going to tell our member because he would be really mad that we let him in. Oh, I wonder if anybody else got to talk to these people. And there's a rumble that happens. The whole capital starts to shake. You know, Tea Party people are here. Freedom fighters are here. Gun people are in the building. <laughs> we need to continue to, to, to put that steel rod of freedom in places that make them shiver. <laughs> and we need to be proud and we need to be loud when we do it. Never backing down from our, 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 our honesty, our traditional American value way of being polite, of being truthful, of being uh, good patriotic Americans. We should never back away from that. They're the ones who lie. They're the ones who believe it's immoral for them not to lie if by lying it moves their agenda forward. We don't believe that's the way it works. We have a conscience. We think that if we lie, first it bothers us. And it bothers us because, golly, that puts me in a tough situation with this way. He knows. So we start to get, they don't have that. Therefore, lying is a tactic that they use. It's how they achieve, how they move forward. Remember Lenin's hammer. Lenin said that the forward strike, the, the pulling back the hammer was every bit as important as the downward strike. Remember their retreat when they released the pressure? It's just as important when they move forward. What we need to do is fight the left, put them on their heels, have them tripping over themselves, let them fall over, and then make them a skid mark on the roadway of political history as we go back to achieve our bottom line, freedom. It is a bottom line. That's what our job is. Thank you for allowing me to come here. Um, you know, you can go to our website, which is www.gunownersca.com. That's Gun Owners California, G-U-N-O-W-N-E-R-S-C-A. And you can find out all of the things that we're doing, how to get involved in, in campaigns, how to lobby, what bills are, being, are, um, are, are coming up, local issues and stuff like that. We invite you to take a look and then tell your friends. I want to encourage you, you wouldn't be here if you weren't freedom fighters and ready to take this country back by storm. So, God bless you, thank you, and let freedom ring, huh? www.gunownersca.com, G-U-N-O-W-N-E-R-S-C-A.com. Okay, thank you very much. By the way, everybody in their back pocket should have one of these all the time, huh? Yeah, one of these. Thanks.